still rocking after all these years. This is the story of my rock and roll butler. This is it, the show that started it all. Often imitated, but never equal. From San Francisco, USA, uh, online since 2004, right. it's the one and only yeah. Rock and Roll Geek Show with the original Rock and Roll Geek, Michael Butler. Welcome to the Rock and Roll Geek Show. My name is Michael Butler. Thanks a lot for joining me. I really appreciate it. Today is Monday, October 10th, 2016, when I'm recording this intro. Tonight, I'm going to play uh, part one of a series I'm going to be doing. I, I got this book sent to me uh, a couple of weeks ago. It is called Lost Rockers, and I... and when I went up to visit my daughter in Washington, I brought the book with me. Um, a guy who listens to my show, uh, his name is his name is Tony Mann, and um, he was one of the co-writers on this book. And he said, "Hey, can I send you this book?" He's a friend of the show. Who knows? A, a friend of the show is an author and a uh, yeah, an author and a scholar. Well, he asked me if he could send me this book, and I said, "Okay." And I wasn't really expecting much, but I've, it's, it's a nice looking book. It's a hard cover. It's got a, it's. It's, it's got a lot of good pictures in it, and it looks professionally done. It is uh, on Powerhouse Books. I think it's part of Penguin Publishing. But anyway, it's a nice-looking book. So I brought it to, Mar- to uh, on the plane with me to visit Martina, and I'm really, I started really getting into the book. It's basically it's about it's uh, a bunch of chapters about, and each chapter is a different person who was like basically an unknown. A person that uh, could have been big or should have been big, uh, but was never big. There's like, let me see, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, like 19 chapters, 19 different artists. So anyway, I started reading this book, and um, it's each chapter is a little story on uh, you know each, each artist. And on the plane I was reading, and I was really enjoying it. And I got this idea, I said, because he wanted to come, because Tony wanted to come on the show and talk and promote the book, which I was happy to do regardless. But I, I thought, you know, I like this book so much. Why don't we go over every artist in the book and do like a four part uh, series on it? You know, I can get four podcasts out of it and we can plug the book and. Hear stories about each of these artists. So that's what I'm doing, friends. I, I have done the, I've recorded the first two parts already. Uh, so what I'm editing tonight is the first part. Yes, this is when I'm actually editing a, a rock and roll geek show. I never edit the show, but I'm editing this one because uh, I'm recording the intro because I already talked about, I already talked to Tony about, um, in this episode is going to be six artists. And then the next one, I think we did three or four artists. Uh, the second episode is is a lot better than the first, but I, hopefully you'll like the first one as well. If you don't, don't get too discouraged. I hope you stick with me through this series because uh, it's going to get better. Anyway, I talked to, to Tony um, when I got back, and we went over the first six chapters. The chapters in the book are, uh, well, the ones we did tonight are... Well, I'll just let you. I'll just let you listen to the episode, and then you can hear what we're talking about. But it's a great book. It's called Lost Rockers, written by Stephen Blush with Paul Rockman and Tony Mann. Stephen Blush and Paul Rockman. I think they did. They uh, there's also a movie coming out on, on this book. It's already the movie's already done. Uh, the people who did the movie are. And Stephen Blush, the two guys also did the movie, and they did a they did a movie called um, American Hardcore. I think that's the name of the of the movie and book. Those guys did that mo- book and movie as well. So it's pretty good pedigree of guys who wrote this thing. Tony Mann, good guy, friend of the show, and he and I talk. This problem, this episode, we talk for about forty five minutes, and I'm going to put clips of each artist in these chapters. Uh, so hope you enjoy it. Once again, the name of the book is lost rockers and yeah, hope you enjoy it. I'm actually going out of town on Wednesday. So I'm going to get this. I'm going to try to get this episode posted before I go out of town. I'm going to back to Florida and to Georgia to visit family and I'm going to go hunting and fishing. 
while I'm in Florida, I'm going to be probably trying to do an episode a day or every other day. I'm going to be doing another Notes from the Tree Stand uh, series, a little short podcast, kind of like a mini dog day. So I hope you're... I hope you are into that. If not, you can fast forward through all these episodes. But anyway, that's what tonight is, Lost Rockers. And then I'll be in Florida. I might get another one. I might try. I'm going to, I have no time to uh, put the podcast together and stuff because I'm leaving on Wednesday, but I'm doing my best. I have Feather Witch practice tomorrow, and then Wednesday I got to pack and get on the plane. But I'm going to try to get the other episode posted before I go as well, but Hopefully this one at least will be posted. I hope you like it. Enough of my rambling. Thank you to everybody who donated. You know who you are. Without your donations, this show would die a horrible, putrid, stench-filled death. All right. Without further ado, why don't actually why don't I play a little bit of the first artist? Her name is Evie Sands, and this is a song that I'm sure you've heard. She had the very first recording of this song, and somebody else, right after she recorded it, somebody else recorded it and had a major hit with it, and she did not. And this is kind of the story of Evie Sands' career as well. People, she was a great singer and songwriter, had a great songwriting team behind her as well, and producers and other DJs would get the test pressing and find one of their artists to record it and release it before Evie Sands. And yeah, well, you'll hear about that. So here's Evie Sands version of angel in the morning. You might not like all the music in these of all these artists, but their stories are really good. So stick with the music or you don't have to stick with the music. If you don't want, you can fast forward, but uh, stick with the book because these are some great stories and these people deserve to have their stories told. All right, here's Evie Sands, and then we'll go into the Tony Mann interview. There'll be no strings to bind your hands Not if my love can't bind your heart There'll be no Stand, for it was I that chose to start. 
Hey, Tony, man. How's it going? All right, Michael Butler. How are you, man? I'm super, Good to hear from you. I'm super great. Couldn't be better. Thanks for asking. So I got, I got the book Lost Rockers uh, written by... Tell me, so what, what is your part in the book? It says by Stephen Blush, Paul Bachman, and Tony Mann. So what is your part in this book? By the okay, way, this so book, so. it is a great book. Uh, first, tell me, tell me, give me the um, elevator pitch for, for, for people who uh, <laughs> okay. might want to check out the book. Okay. Um, yeah, this is uh, Lost Rockers, uh, Broken Dreams, and Crashed Careers. And it's by Stephen Blush, Paul Rockman and myself tony man and it's on powerhouse books uh it's distributed through random house so you can get it at amazon or barnes and noble uh it's been out for a little while now and uh took us uh took us a few years to get it together and it sheds light on some talented people that for some reason didn't make it you might know their song or something about them uh, or they did something really interesting but um didn't quite you know make it to a superstar you know, household name status, like some of their peers. And it covers a wide range of artists. And uh, most of them are still making music today or involved in it in some way or other. I, so it's their lifestyle. You know, it uh, deals with fame and when people don't get famous and some people maybe don't have the killer instinct for fame or whatnot, and other people do. I can't so, get enough uh, of these... Of I can't get enough of... I like talking to people who... Uh, well, I like talking to big stars, but to me, the real good sure. stories are people who got. Uh, I like hearing stories about people who get, uh, like the underdogs. You like the underdogs, yeah, and they kind of get eaten up by the record business, and uh, well, yeah, you know, yeah. chewed up and yeah. spit out, and blah blah blah. But uh, this book, well, the record, the, the record business ate itself, so yeah, you know, exactly. Well, they got what they deserve. Revenge, revenge is sweet, exactly. <laughs> So this book, I got you sent it to me, and I really wasn't expecting to uh, like it that much. But I picked, I brought it on the plane with me. I was, went to visit my daughter, and I and I started reading it. I didn't hear, I didn't Great. know about any of the. The only pe person that I knew about in this book was, well, I knew about um, Charlie Farron because he played with Joe Perry Project, and I knew Cherry Vanilla just because about because of the name Cherry Van Vanilla from. Uh, Please kill me, and you know the New York punk rock right. scene. So I didn't really know any of these other um, artists okay. by name. But once I started reading it, they're really great stories, and it's 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 compelling. I guess the word is to hear to to hear the stories about these people who real, never really made it in stars. So I figure we well, would. You, you can you can relate. You know, we're, I'm a musician myself. <laughs> yeah, you know, we can exactly. relate to these things that have happened to us or people we know, and. Uh, you no, know, people almost made it. I've I've been asked to join a many famous bands, and for whatever reason, I didn't. Or things have happened to me. I've been ripped off. You know, so I can relate to these people. The story is: um, Stephen Blush is an author. He used to have his own magazine called Seconds Magazine. Yeah, I he also that. wrote for yeah. Paper Magazine and Interview and High Times. And he wrote a book called American Hardcore about the hardcore punk scene. Uh -huh. And uh, ten years later, he wrote an updated version of that. And it's one of the best-selling rock books ever. And uh, him and Paul Rockman together. Paul Rockman is primarily a filmmaker, video editor and whatnot, and a director. And they made the film American Hardcore. So they were a team. And I've been friends with Stephen Blush for quite some time. And uh, I'd say about we, uh, we've been working together almost 10 years now. But he was also a promoter, promoted rock shows. He had a night called Rock Candy at a club here in New York called Don Hills. And um, so, you know, he's promoted hardcore shows, rock shows. Uh, he's a DJ. So, you know, he's not a musician, but, you know, he's been around the scene for years. And uh, he was writing a book, and he uh, had some questions about who was in the lineup of the Brats and bands like that. And I said, hey, I'll just call them and ask, you know, every lineup they had. And... Uh, so then he's like, oh, well, you know all these people? And yeah, I have grew up here and I played music and played with a lot of them or know them from the scene. So uh, my part in this is kind of providing content. Like I, I know the people personally or I don't have a problem approaching people as well. And then I conducted some of the interviews. I transcribed some of the interviews. Uh, you know, I was one of the photo editors on the book. I had to do the photo research and find the guy who took this picture from 50 years ago and things like that that you don't think about when you're looking at a book like this. 
And uh, I've, I've played with some of the people in this book. And uh, so I thought their stories were all great. And uh, we started working on this. Uh, we actually made a documentary called Lost Rockers. Oh, is that okay, out? So is that, it has not that's, come out that's, yet, right? No, it's screened as a work in progress at Lincoln Center. And uh, we're working on the legalities of getting it out because the thing with these kind of people is they don't own their music, most of them. So they don't they get screwed. They don't get paid. So we have to pay somebody else money to use the music you know, these people's these artists songs and yeah. the film about them which is ridiculous but there you go with uh, music and music law so um but anyway in the interim um steven blush wrote this lo- great lost rockers book and we all you know i pitched in and uh uh i've also worked with him on another book that just came out the other day called new york rock that's a uh, history of new york rock from velvet underground days till the closing of cbgb so We've been doing a lot of work together, and uh, you know, I've become a writer in the process, at least getting skilled at doing oral history and all the other aspects of writing. Yeah. So I think all these people are super interesting stories, and we whittled it down. I mean, uh, we had lists of hundreds of people, and these people were all the most compelling, and uh, everybody knows somebody like this. And, um, you know, it's a, you know, disposable music today doesn't have much soul, but all these people, you know, they got a lot of heart and soul and uh, their stories are far more interesting than a lot of pop-up stars that come out today. So anyway, that's some some of my feelings on it. So I figured what we would do would be a kind of a nice change of pace for the Rock and Roll Geek Show. I figured we would do um, Great. every chapter in the book and spread it out into like four episodes. Are you into doing that with me? Yeah, it sounds amazing. Sounds- it's an honor. Yeah. Well, I don't know how much of an honor it'll be. You might be uh, tired. Of, you might be really bummed out after you hear this episode. But. <laughs> um, and I, I, you know, I love all these people, and I've, I've you know, you yeah. Know, so there a couple are, of them have passed. A couple of them have passed away. So you know, some. Uh, so you interviewed some of these people artifacts. before they died, or or yes. they are about okay. So let's. Yeah, why some of we, these people have passed away. You know, in the time we've been working on it. You know. So, so why don't we take it from the top, as they say? In the, okay, in the, right. So the first chapter is a woman named Evie Sands, and I I didn't really I, I like again uh, like I said I haven't these none of these names are household names. Um, this girl named Evie Sands. Um, here's what I got from the thing she wrote, or she didn't write the, the she she was. A she was a singer. A, She's a, a singer sing- and a musician. Yeah. She's a songwriter, but she's primarily. You know, like a lot of artists doing other people's songs. One of the main songwriters that worked with her was Chip Taylor, who you know from writing Wild Thing and uh, Rock Soldiers for Ace Frehley. And he's a big hit songwriter. And he was John Voight's brother. And he's Angelina, Angelina Jolie's uncle. So Chip Taylor, who wrote Wild Thing, wrote a lot of songs. He was trying to help make Evie a star because she's a great singer. She's a great soulful singer. She's a great uh, guitar player. And part of Evie's dilemma is that she's an attractive woman and uh, they wanted to tart her up and make her be like a sexy, saucy front woman. And she likes to play guitar. And she was, you know, on the Johnny Cash show playing guitar and on the Glenn Campbell. And, you know, if you can play guitar with those guys, you're, you're pretty good. And, um, you know, that was, that was one of her problems. Uh, so one of her she- main problems was uh, there's a lot of underhanded dealings in the music business and she'd get a hit song and before it even came out uh, a test pressing of it would um you know fly around to people and somebody else would record it and put it out before yeah, her particularly you know? that that happened on a lot of her songs she was first of all she was a really cute girl a beautiful girl yes. and when she was like yeah she's yeah she's still beautiful she's great she was like 16 great. years old and she would knock yep. on record uh, company doors and somebody heard her music and um this guy Chip Taylor, mm-hmm. he wrote he wrote this song called "Angel in the Morning," right? That's right, he did. And yes, he did. That song is a really famous song, and um, yes, it is. Yes, it is. But the version it's famous from isn't hers. Yes, but well, she did. She did start to have a hit with it, and then um, tell that the story. Label, tell that story yeah. because uh, she was okay. Somebody basically so, stole the song and recorded it before hers was released, right? Yes, that's that's correct. And uh, what happened is uh, this singer Jackie Ross, who was on Chess Records, black right? woman, black woman, uh, uh, Evie Sands, yeah. white white so, girl, cute white girl. 
That's correct. And um, what happened is, you know, she was knocking on the Brill Building doors and she befriended, you know, Al Gorgoni and Chip Taylor and all these great people. And they brought her single to, you know, Lieber, Sto- Lieber and Stoller, like really big, big time songwriting type people, you know, the, the big, the real music industry of America. And, um, you know, she was big enough to make it. So, you know, so her first, her first song was going to be Take Me For A Little While, okay? And that is the one that was acetate. She pressed it, and before it even came out, uh, they got an acetate, and they got Jackie Ross to, to put it out before her. All right? Who got the acetate? Uh, who who was yeah. the acetate? Uh, what's that? Excuse me? Who got the who got the test pressing and decided to release it before before Evie Sands? Well, um, uh, the people that work with Jackie Ross, it got around in the industry somehow that th- this is hot. You got to get this. Okay, and, so know, her- that someone put this out. So it, it had a buzz before it came out because what would happen is it press a few acetates and circulate them around, trying to pitch the song to whatever they were going to do with it. You know, and, and you can only play an acetate a few times. It's like a, it's like a disposable record that's pressed onto metal. And if you play it too much, it'll just basically break and fall right. apart. But um, anyway, in those days, they used to pass an acetate around and try to hype it up in whatever way. And in this case, it got to uh, the team that was working with Jackie Ross, and they uh, they put out "Take Me for a Little While," and they had the hit with it. The thing with "Angel of the Morning" was that. Okay, um, uh, uh, so that happened, and she lost her first hit. And, uh, you know, she she looked in the chart. The song was supposed to be coming out, like, take me for a little while. So she looked in the trade papers. Wow, take me for a little while is a hit. And it's like, Jackie Ross, like, why isn't it? What's that? So yeah, then she thought it was her. That, she, thought that she, had her she thought that she had the hit. She, she thought that she had a hit. Everybody, it was a hit. You know, even her version is fantastic. So, um you know, uh, yeah. They, so what's what? What happened? They were in Chicago. They got the acetate in the hands of someone in Chess Records. So they stopped the session. Jackie Ross was doing and had her do "Take Me for a Little While." Right? They stopped the session to make her do it. And then Evie found out. And then you know everybody got upset about this. They were angry. And uh, then she put out another song uh, that they didn't want to hype up because of some payback for "Take Me for a Little While." Because they kind of had like everything lined up for it to be a hit. Like probably greased some palms and paid some people off, and then other people had a hit. So there was a lot of backlash about this. And then she was going to put out this uh, another um, Chip Taylor Al Gorgoni song called "Can't Let Go," right? And then radio avoided it because in a kind of form of revenge for taking me for a little while. And then um, uh, the Hollies later had a hit with it. Okay, so um, so she had that twice in a row. And she's getting really frustrated. And then it came to be time for um, uh, uh, Angel of the Morning. And um, that was on Cameo Parkway. Now, you know, Neil Bogart has something to do with that company. So what happened is... Uh, um, Neil they Bogart had, uh, from Casablanca Records. Yeah, he yeah. He was also Capo, with uh, um, Buddha. Yeah. He was, you know, he was the king of bubblegum and he was the king of disco. But uh, he was involved with Cameo Parkway. And um, so Chip Chip Taylor got Evie signed to Cameo Parkway, and that was a big label at the time, right? And then so um, so uh, then she put out a couple singles. It didn't do so much, and then she they did uh, Angel of the Morning, right? And uh, uh, it was um, they started selling about ten thousand copies of that, and then the label went under. So Merrily Rush put out Angel of the Morning and had the big hit with it. So she, her label went under, you know, when she was going to have a hit with that. So she's had a lot of heartache with this kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, she's carried on. And um, uh, she later had another, like, minor hit with Any Way That You Want Me. And then uh, that was a song that was a hit for the, for the Trogs. So Chip Taylor has truly been her, you know, won her backers, someone behind her, the whole, yeah. her whole career. This guy wrote her tons but, of great songs, and she had a hit with basically none of them, and other people went on to have yeah. hits with these songs. What is she, yeah. what is she doing now? Is she- yeah, she's still playing, and um, actually, like, um, over maybe like a year and a half ago, she put out an album with uh, Billy Vera, who had uh, Billy Vera and the Beaters uh-huh. had a big hit way back. Uh, she did a duets album with him, and she plays around the L.A. scene. And um, you know, she has like a um, 
pretty low key life. You know, she's certainly not a star, but um, she's got, you know, a lot of charisma and star power. And she's got a great voice. She still sings and plays great. And she has a band and she plays local shows once in a while. And the, the most recent album she did was with uh, Billy Vera. And uh, she's just had awful luck with uh, these people scooping her from the hits. And she had the hits and uh, her versions sound great, too, when you hear them. Like that could have very well been the hit if it got the push. No, I know a lot of people who are on, in particular, RCA records and would have a hit, and then RCA wouldn't even print the records when it became a hit. So it's kind of uh, who you got working with you. If the people are on your side, sometimes the people leave the company and you don't have anybody um, working on your behalf at the label, and you're you know, out of luck then. The next chapter is a guy named Alan Merrill. I didn't know the name Alan Merrill, but I did know the band The Arrows. Uh, Right. Mm -hmm. Joan Jett, when she was in The Runaways, I think this is the story mm -hmm. that I remember by reading the book. Um, when Joan Jett was in The Runaways, she went, when they were touring Europe or England or somewhere, uh, she saw the Arrows play the song I Love Rock and Roll, and she wanted The Runaways to record it. And That's the, right. And none of The Runaways wanted to record it for whatever reason. Maybe Kim, or, uh, maybe, uh, Kim Fowley didn't want it. Who knows? But, yeah, uh, it's, it's to do with Kim Fowley for sure, because he, you know, he was controlling them, obviously. So Alan yeah. Merrill was the singer for this band, The Arrows, and he wrote I Love Rock and Roll. Tell me about Alan Merrill. Okay, Alan Merrill. Um, boy, he, he, uh, he's related to Laura Nero. That's his cousin. And he, le he, learned, uh, he learned a lot from her. And uh, he grew up in a musical family. His mom's a jazz singer, Helen Merrill. And... Uh, his dad was a sax player for Benny Goodman, so he grew up around music. And uh, he learned, you know, he learned playing in a lot of different bands around the village. Same kind of places like where Jimi Hendrix would play, like Cafe Wa and stuff like that. And, um, you know, he, uh, at one point he auditioned to be in the Left Bank. So he's been around the, you know, the West Village kind of music scene for quite a while. But then his... Um, his mom got married to someone, uh, remarried, and they moved to Japan. So he kind of grew up for a while in Japan. And then he almost became like the Mark Bolin of Japan at the time when Mark Bolin was uh, was around, you know, was popular in like 71. And uh, he, had, he even had... He, he had the he rock, had a whole other career in Japan. He had the rock haircut and he had a good rock and roll look. And they probably oh, yeah, totally they, cool. they probably liked him in Japan because he had uh, well, first of all, he was American. They liked Americans in Japan back then. And, mm -hmm. uh, he had a good look. Yeah, he looked cool, cool looking guy, um, charismatic. Uh, he can play and write, and he had a cool band. And uh, you know, he um, he yeah, he was he was a good looking like. Uh, kind of like cute guy at the time, like David Cassidy or something like that. So um, he was very popular in Japan, but he wasn't making that much money doing this in Japan. And he moved to London and he started working with Mickey Most, that producer who produced tons of hits for everybody. Yeah. For the animals and Jeff Beck and Donovan. All kinds. Of, yeah. On and on and on. So uh, then that guy was putting together the arrows. So he got in the arrows. So the other guy in the Arrows that he would write these songs with, who actually co-wrote I Love Rock and Roll, is Jake Hooker. And he's, he's since passed away. But the, the Arrows had a TV show, and they would have like Mark Bolin on there and Slade on there and you know, all the cool British rock bands. So, you know, if you went from being a pop star in Japan to being like a teen idol in, in England, it's pretty cool. And then, yeah, uh, Joan saw them play that, I love rock and roll on the show, but she didn't do it till later. She did do a version with a couple of the Sex Pistols at one point before. I don't know if you've ever heard that with uh, uh, Cook and Jones. She did a version of yeah, I love rock and roll. I think that was one of the outtakes for uh, the Bad Reputation album. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but she, you know, she she always she had it in her mind to do this song, yeah. and uh, her version's great, no no doubt. It's and, actually uh, pretty true to the original. The original is pretty rock and version as well. Absolutely. It's cool. And uh, so I, I think he said he made the most off 
I think Britney Spears did a version of it. Oh, really? And I think he said he actually made the most of it huh. from Britney Spears doing it. For so he reason. pretty much, and the, he can pretty much survive. I don't know if he could survive for the rest of his life, but he probably made a good chunk of change off of uh, just royalties for that song. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He, yeah, he's one of the guys who holds on to his royalties. And he lives here in New York and he, you know, plays local shows. And uh, I saw him. After that period, he was playing with uh, Derringer. I saw him play with Derringer. Rick Derringer, yeah. And I saw him play with uh, Meatloaf as well for a while. So what did he do? What uh, What did he do? Did he record with Meatloaf, or was he just a touring guitar player? Um, He was doing pretty good. Uh, you know, he's on, uh, I think, the Live at Wembley. Uh-huh. Um, and then... Um, uh, he he did an album, a solo album, with like Mick Taylor and Steve Winwood and a bunch of people on it. And uh, then he wrote a theme song for HBO show, the Encyclopedia Brown. And um, he did all kinds of stuff. He's al- always like writing. Uh, but the thing is that he always has the royalties from Joe and Jet having that hit and other people having you know done that song. I knew she must have been about 17 Mm. The beat was going strong Playing my favorite song And I could tell it wouldn't be long Till she was with me, yeah me And I could tell it wouldn't be long Till she was with me, yeah me Next chapter in the book, we're whizzing through these mm-hmm. chapters, but uh, next chapter is a guy named Chris Robeson. Is that how you pronounce, pronounce his name, Robeson? That's right, yes. And he's from Connecticut. I had never heard of this guy, but there's a New York Dolls connection, which I did, yes, not, there is. I did not know. Go ahead and tell me a little bit about Chris Robeson. Robeson. Okay. Uh, Chris Robeson is super talented. He plays every um, instrument. He teaches piano still to this day. He teaches and teaches music. Uh, he still lives in Connecticut. Um, he uh, played keyboards in a band, and that would um, become the touring version of the band Steam, that had that na 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 for Paul Lecca. Hey, so this hey, guy, hey, goo about yeah. that one, yeah, yeah. Everybody's heard that at baseball games. Right. And uh, anyway, so this guy Paul Lecca was in Bridgeport, Connecticut and was a producer and made these hits like Green Tambourine and stuff like that. And there wasn't really a band. He made it with a bunch of session guys. And then if it had a hit, he'd put a touring band together. Like there was a bunch of versions of Steam touring around the country. And uh, Chris Robeson was in one of them. And wherever they would play, they'd have to open the set with na 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 and it, close it with that too. And they could play anything else they wanted in the middle <laughs> as far as the guy was concerned. So uh, he he didn't even play on that recording, but he was in the touring version of Steam. And uh, so anyway, um, uh, later they cut their own um, 45 using the name Steam, but it wasn't, you know, and it charted a little bit. And that got him to another, another level. So um, the thing about Chris is that uh, he'd play around the village with all kinds of people and he'd show up and jam with like Bob Dylan uh, he played in the park uh, with um, Bette Midler uh, at actually like an early kind of gay pride type 
um, ceremony yeah, in so Washington Square Park. Interrupt for a and, second. Uh, one thing people, uh, 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 he was actually one of the first openly gay guys. He was, he was out and, um, yeah, he was, he yes, was, am- that's true. Amongst the rock scene and, um, in the music business, a lot of people didn't weren't weren't out of the closet, so to speak. I guess, and his music, he yeah. a lot of songs about being gay. Yeah, he he later had a solo career where he made these overtly, you know, erotically gay songs. That you know, but he was, you know, some people loved him for it, some people didn't. But he, he's a great musician. And uh, another thing he did was he played an Elephant's Memory. Okay, so he's on the Midnight Cowboy soundtrack and a bunch of things like that. And then what happened, um, uh, uh, he quit um, Elephant's Memory for a while, and then John Lennon joined Elephant's Memory. <laughs> and uh, so he had been in the band, and then John Lennon joined it right well, when he quit. So John Lennon so, had um, took Elephant's Memory as his backing band. That's correct. And uh, Without, so, without uh, this guy, Chris, Rob, Chris Robeson. Right, but then what happened is um, Chris was involved in the recording, so he did get to record with John, and John played guitar on song he wrote and everything. So he did have some inter- interaction with him in the studio after all, and uh, so that's pretty cool. And um, then he moved to L.A. to play with this guy, Velvet Turner, and that guy was kind of like the next Hendrix type guy, all right, uh, and wor- worked with this... Um, producer tom wilson okay so uh you know he velvet turner was like a taller version of Jimi hendrix and uh so these guys had like a band velvet turner group and they were trying to be like the next hendrix okay so um and then what happened is like jimmy you know those guys were all friends and then jimmy went to england and Jimi hendrix became the Jimi Hendrix we know. He came here. Other people here, you know, he left everybody in the dust. And he was better than the other people anyway, so there's more than one reason for that. Okay, so then um after that kind of didn't work out. Uh he ended up doing um some solo stuff. All right. And uh he played with a lot of people that ended up playing with the motels and stuff like this. And uh, he rented a house from the Turtles and was trying living in in uh, L.A. for a while while he's working with Velvet Turner. And um, after that didn't work out, he moved back to the village. All right, and then uh, you know um, that's when he ended up like doing the stuff with Lennon and Elephant's Memory. But he, he wasn't back in the band. But when they recorded, he ended up uh, recording with them. So that's pretty cool. And then. He started doing solo records, right? And um, uh, he was called like a pansexual, all right? And uh, he did a couple of solo albums that were basically overtly gay. And uh, he had a hard time, you know? Uh, he, he, he really had a hard time because he was right out there. And these other guys were kind of trying to be like, oh, well, we're bisexual. And he was just like, I'm gay. And, you know, it didn't fly too well for a while at uh kind of hurt everybody's career that was coming out at that time. But uh, he played at the first Gay Pride concert in the park with Bette Midler. And uh, that's, you know, now that's part of history, but at the time it was like, you know, not everybody was into that or supportive of it, that's for sure. So he joined a version of the New York Dolls. When he when he joined the New York Dolls, uh, this was, was this after Jerry Nolan died? And what, when was he in the New York Dolls? No, no, no. It, it's not after Jerry Nolan died, but what happened is uh, New York Dolls <clears throat> went to when Malcolm McLaren was managing them, when they had the red patent leather right. yeah. thing. Okay, and they were, you know, playing under the uh, hammer and sickle flag and all that stuff. Right. And this is during Vietnam. So, you know, this really wasn't too cool in America to be like your communists at that point, you know. So it was very controversial. And uh, Malcolm McLaren took all that he learned from that tour and later created the Sex Pistols. But uh, the New York Dolls went to Florida, all right, and um, uh, Jerry Nolan and Johnny Thunders ended up quitting the band. So at that point, uh, Pete, P- 
Pete Jordan was the bass player and had played bass a lot of times instead of Arthur as well throughout the Dolls' career when Arthur couldn't do it or when he hurt his hand or right. whatnot. Right. So the, the lineup when Chris Robeson was in it was David Johansson, Sylvain, Peter Jordan on bass, uh, Tony Machine on drums, and Chris on keyboards and sometimes would play guitar. So they didn't have you know, really the second guitarist at that time. But they went to Tokyo and they played stadiums. You know, played giant stadiums for thousands of people. And they were on covers of magazines and all that. But when they came back here, they would call it like the Dollettes. But when they went to Japan at that time, they, you know, New York Dolls playing a baseball stadium. So it was like, you know, he was in this huge band all of a sudden. So something and, happened. Uh, something happened and he got kicked out of the Dolls. And he wrote... Didn't he write uh, some stuff that was on David Johansson's first solo album? Did he write Funky But yeah. Chic? Yes, he did. Which and was he also a great tune, Frenchette. by the way. He also yeah. wrote Frenchette. That's a, mm-hmm. that, Dave, that first David Johansson solo album is a great album. Yes, it is, but you know that's why he doesn't play those songs well, anymore, tell, too, well, tell, because it's been some dispute with him Dave, and Dave, jo- Dave Johansson and, uh, doesn't play those songs anymore. What Tell about what happened when... Um, so he got kicked out of the of the um, the Dolls. What happened? He got drunk or something. It's not really that clear to me what happened. Yeah, he just... He, he, uh, yeah, he was drunk, and um, he just didn't go on the tour, you know? He kind of... Uh, Fell into a depression there and uh, just blew it. He left the band, you know. He, you know, he just didn't go. So he didn't go. They were supposed to go on a tour. I think they were going to play at Cobo Hall, and he he didn't go. So that was the end of that. And uh, didn't he end up suing you know, David start- Johansson? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had some uh, legal legal goings on about because he did, you know, wrote French at. He wrote, he wrote some songs on. He wrote some songs on that David Johansson solo album that he didn't get credit for, mm-hmm. and he sued That's Dave right. Johansson. So you, if you'll, you'll never hear Dave Johansson play "Funky But Chic" or "French Ad" or any of these songs because right. because this Chris Robinson guy sued him. That's correct. <laughs> That's right. So then after that, oh, and also b- before that, uh, just before that time, uh, Chris Robinson had uh, actually played with. Uh, you know, at the time it was like Wicked Lester, done some stuff. Kiss, uh, um, guys from Kiss. Yeah, before they before they became Kiss. Yeah, and uh, then later he went to the Fillmore show and saw one of the very early Kiss shows, and uh, he was like, kind of taken aback by the whole thing. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he was approached to play in that band at one point by Gene.
chapter is a woman named Ginger Bianco. Oh, right. Yeah. I just saw her the other night. She was in Goldie and the Gingerbreads, which was basically the first girl band that was signed. And that you might know the, the singer, Genya Raven. Oh, I didn't know she um, was. I so, didn't know that when she was in that band. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Genya Raven around in the punk rock um, days, in the CBGB's days. Mm-hmm. So Ginger was... Gingerbread and uh, Genya Raven was uh, Goldie. Huh, I did not in know that. that. Band. Mm-hmm. And Ginger so that was Bian- in the sixties. Ginger and, Bianco uh, was the drummer. Ginger Ginger Bianco was the drummer. Yeah, this was way before. This is the the uh, real first run. The real Runaways. Uh, this the all these girls. Oh, yeah. all these girls played instruments. They played they played guitar, drums, and so this was oh, long yeah. before the Runaways. Yeah, this is in 1963. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, uh, they uh, they were pioneers for sure. And um, she's uh, she was also in a band called Isis that used to play at um, used to play at Coventry and places like that. So she, um, you know, it's like they had a lot of great gigs, but it didn't quite make it. You know. Uh, you know, the, the uh, Goldie and the Gingerbreads um, used to perform at, like, um, Warhol parties and stuff like that. It looked like they were really going to get big, you know, and they play at the Peppermint Lounge and places like that. And, um, you know, uh, it's like they they did make a dent, but uh, that was pretty ahead of the time. Ben Isis was around in the 70s. Was that all? That was all girls, too, right? Mm-hmm. I just, they opened up for uh, Aerosmith, uh, Skin, Leonard Skinner, uh, ZZ Top, mm-hmm. and they played with yeah, and they 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 headlined over Kiss at Coventry. Well, yeah, because they refused to go on before Kiss. They wanted to. They insisted on closing, right? Yeah, and Kiss. Yeah. Uh, needless to say, nobody wanted to see anybody else after Kiss. Kiss. Um, so it was not a good idea insisting that you headline mm-hmm. over Kiss. Yeah, they were ahead of their time too, both of those bands. And uh, you know, it's like uh people couldn't handle it then. It's the same thing as like Chris Roberson. That was ahead of his time. You know, and now these people are a lot more accepting of this because of these people were pioneers of it, you know. Chapter is a guy named Brett Smiley. 
This guy was oh, yeah. this guy was tapped to be uh as big as David Bowie. Exactly, yeah, and he had uh, Andrew Lou Goldham for a manager. And uh he uh he went through a lot and Brett Smiley you know, looked like a pretty girl, basically. You wouldn't even know if it was a guy if you saw the photos. You know, he's a really good looking uh cross gender looking guy and uh glam rock, he total had glam rock looking very glam. Yeah, very glam, very glam rock. There's a book about him called The Prettiest Star, and uh, pretty appropriate. And he, unfortunately, he recently passed away. But um, Brett Smiley um, went through a lot, and I think he was very young. Uh, He was kind of like a child star. Um, He was in musicals as a kid. And uh, the thing was that he... um, uh, like most child stars, he's kind of a uh, tortured career. You know, you get a lot of adulation when you're young, and then you kind of wonder what it's all about later. Like, you kind of got all the best things life has to offer early on, so kind of hard to live through the other stuff. Um, he was the youngest ever guy to play Oliver, and, uh, you know, he went to junior high with Michael Jackson, and then he was in a band with... Uh, uh, Doug Fager, who joined uh, later joined the Knack, called Sky. Uh huh. Right, Fager. and so that was all when he was a kid, you know. So he was already like done a lot of really cool stuff as a kid, and um, super good looking so guy. Got, it, got caught up in drugs, big time. Yeah, he really did. And uh, he um, he uh, there's a famous um, interview of him. Uh, when he's just smashed and out of his mind and you can see the kind of life he was living, you know, uh, it, he really was, um, being propped up by Oldham and really thought he could become the next Bowie and that's just let big shoes to step into for this guy. You know, um, he had a really cool style and a cool sound and, um, you know, Oldham put a lot on him and it just didn't make it. And, uh, unfortunately, uh, he started like a downward spiral. And, uh, you know, I'm friends with the band Milk and Cookies. And um, we, played a, we played a show in Brooklyn with them. And uh, this guy was at the door one, di- one day. And uh, it was Brett. And I was, are you Brett Smiley? And yeah, nobody had seen him for a long time. And uh, you know, he'd been through a lot. Someone had... Uh, robbed him and like cut his face with a knife and he had been through a lot you know and so um he never kind of recovered from that it's pretty sad he tried to play some shows he wrote some other original songs but none none of them sounded anything like his early his early hits and he could never kind of get back into that head to do that thing again um and uh the guys in milk and cookies were shocked when we saw him in the club because they they knew him they they had uh gone to see the sex pistols with him way back in the day and they hadn't seen him since then since they were all kids and here he was like kind of almost like a derelict guy he was in a bad way and he was a really sweet guy it's really really shame that that he passed away he was really a nice guy but uh so you know he stuck around the scene and he was trying to play shows here and there but he just didn't sound the same or look the same anymore and he'd just kind of been beaten down been, been through a lot So he was someone that was really beat up by the industry and, uh, you know, got into bad substance abuse and uh, just kind of never really recovered and passed away not too long ago. It's kind of sad. It's like a pretty, pretty hard story for sure. But he had the whole androgyny thing down and he had a really cool image and sound and those records still sound cool today.
do two more well, chapters in this episode okay all right sounds good uh the next one Excellent. the next one is a woman named Br- betty davis who i'd never heard of super hot looking black girl oh yeah she's amazing she was a funk singer and uh if you didn't know her and you saw her you'd probably think like like you know someone who could be in funkadelic or chaka khan or you know like very showy like cool costumes like you know, sexy black funk funk lady and uh you know she's a lady from um near the pittsburgh area really her name's betty mabry and um what happened is davis is because she she married miles davis oh she was miles davis's wife there you go okay yeah but she was a model she was one of the first black models for wilhelmina and uh so she'd be in like glamour and 17 magazine and all that and she went to see the chambers brothers and she she gave them a song she wrote, and they recorded it. And the song was called Uptown to Harlem. And uh, they recorded her song, so she started to get into it. And she was friends with everybody. And uh, she was cool, so she she started to make her own music. She hooked up with uh, Miles Davis, and then they got married. She was on, and, she was uh, on one of his album covers, right? Yeah, and she was yeah, and she had a great look. She's totally cool. And the thing is that she was having like flings with Hugh Masekela and Hendrix, and the marriage didn't last that long. And that really uh, that really hurt her career because she got blacklisted from Miles Davis. Yeah, Miles Davis um, said, uh, "You screwed me over, so I'm going to screw you over." Basically, that's what happened to her. Yeah, and then uh, you know she was kind of on the verge of stardom when that happened, and. She definitely influenced him how he dressed in the 70s, like around Bitches Brew time and all that when he was getting more into the rock fusion stuff. Um, she was a big influence for him, like playing you know, more funk. And she tried to get him to play with Hendrix, but it didn't happen. But, you know, um, she made some really cool, mu- great funk music. And, uh, you know, it seemed like she was going to get big, but he kind of like put the, put the kibosh on her career, unfortunately. And then she just retired from music and she moved back to where she was from and you don't really see her anymore in public. And they, uh, this, um, cool label light in the attic, uh, reissued some of her stuff. And then, um, she did one interview for it and then she didn't do any more promo for it. So, uh, she just doesn't want anything to do with that stuff anymore. I guess it's probably like pretty tough. You know, she put her heart into what she did and she was cool, but you know, uh, she got blacklisted, basically. Miles Davis screwed over her career. What is she doing now? Yeah, she's retired. I really don't know what she does. She's pretty reclusive. Um, she's one of the people we didn't actually talk to. For, um, oh, and, you know, I don't know her. She doesn't um, want to talk to anybody that, about her past. I know people that, d- that do know her, but she just she, she uh, she's pretty reclusive. And like I said, they reissued all this stuff for her, and uh, she didn't even really promote it hardly at all. She didn't play any shows or anything. She did one interview and that was it. 
and uh, that was a few years ago. But um, I know people that do know her, and they say, yeah, she really doesn't uh, really doesn't do music anymore. It's a shame. She so was. She just seems like pretty pretty retired, and uh, her music's way cool. It's nothing boogie trail I'm on They say I'm different cause I eat shit lens And I can't help it I was born and raised on them That's right every morning Have to stop the hogs and they be getting off Humping the jolly hooker The baby king and Jimmy Lee rock on that And that's why they say I'm different And that's why they say I'm strange I'm talking about Big Mama Pump Talk about it, talk about it Talking about Lightning Hopkins So the last chapter in this episode will be a guy named Pat Briggs. Oh, actually, yeah. Super. I actually know of this guy. I did not know him by name, but he was in this band called the Impotent Sea Snakes, which I had a, uh, when I lived in Florida, I was in a punk rock band, and we had a um, punk rock club, and the Impotent Sea Snakes played our club. Oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, that's great. They were quite. There was something to see. That's they were for from sure. The, they, they were uh, from, I actually, they, I actually played in Psychotica for a bit, and I, I played on some Psychotica recordings as well. I think so they I, were originally you know, I from Pat. Miami. Uh, you know, these snakes originally from Miami. I think maybe I could be wrong. They were, from, they were from the South. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, they'd be like in the Atlanta area, stuff like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pat Pat Briggs um, uh, had uh, had a um, band called Are You Ready? That was like a glam band in the eighties. And, uh, you know, um, it never quite happened. They were a cool band. Very catchy, like, glam metal band. Kind of like Jane's Addiction, Ziggy Stardust, and all those things put together. And then um, uh, they had a deal that didn't, didn't make it. And then, he, you know, he left the band. All right. And then uh, he almost ended up in Warrant, and he helped them write a bunch of the songs that oh, so became he, hits. He was going to really get credit for he that. He was going to take Janie Lane's place in Warrant. Yeah, yeah, he, he was at one huh. point, and it, for some reason that didn't happen. But he did actually help write a bunch of those songs, and just never got credit for it. And he's a super talented guy. He still sings great to this day. Then he was managing the Don Hills Club, and uh, uh, he helped uh, found the band Psychotica. Okay, with uh, Paul Kostabi. Paul Kostabi um, is brother of the artist Mark Kostabi, who did the cover of Guns N' Roses' Use Your Illusion and Ramon's Adios Amigos. And uh, Paul Kostabi also founded White Zombie and a band called Youth Gone Mad uh -huh. that produced Didi, Didi Ramon's last album, which I, I played on. Uh, and so he's done a lot of music, Paul Kostabi, besides being an artist. And Paul named the painting 
Use Your Illusion, which became the title of the Guns N' Roses album. Oh, okay. So anyway, they're from, these are like, you know, art creative people. So very visual people. So makes sense why these guys team up. You know, they're creative. They have a lot of cool costume ideas and whole visual thing going on with Psychotica. So these guys got signed at their first rehearsal to Rick Rubin's uh, American Recordings. Okay, they were rehearsing and they got signed. So the thing is, um, they were kind of hyped up to almost be the next Marilyn Manson or something. Uh -huh. Right, so they, they, uh, they got on Lollapalooza and they were playing on the same stage as Metallica and people like that. So you can imagine, and these guys all of a sudden are in the big time, right? And then uh, it just didn't happen for them. And they made a couple albums that didn't really take off. And then they did an album in England that cost a fortune and didn't come out. Okay? And then they disbanded. So then uh, he went to Hollywood and started club makeup. And then he went to Atlanta, uh, the Glitter Dome. And that's where he was playing with Impotent Sea Snakes. So Atlanta. And he's been in a couple movies. He's a super good-looking guy. He's got a great voice. And uh, then didn't happen for him. He ended up, he moved to Hawaii. So he went, you know, kind of reclusive for a while. And then uh, came back and did a few more um, little tours with Psychotica. And uh, this guy made a documentary about Psychotica, an uh, independent documentary about them. And uh, we played at the Don Hill's Memorial. Don Hill, who had the club where the band first started at, uh, was a big rock promoter in New York. Uh, um, he used to work at Kenny's Castaways, run Kenny's Castaways, which is a famous rock New York club. And then he had his own club, Don Hill's, for years. And um, a lot of bands started there. And uh, Psychotica did. So when, when he passed away, we played at his memorial. And uh, now Pat has... Uh, just put out a new solo album. So he's still doing music. So he seems to go between like Hawaii and California now. It's not on the East Coast too often. All right, Tony, man, that's going to do part one of The Lost Rockers. Next uh, episode, there's there's really good... Uh, the, the one story that I really like is this guy, Bobby Jameson. So I, I'll look forward to talking to you about this guy, Bobby Jameson. This guy... Uh, oh, yeah, he... He went, was amazing. Went amazing. through the fucking ringer, man. And, and uh, Yeah. He's the poster boy for Lost Rockers, this guy. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, he, that guy could have a whole book just about him. He really was amazing. So that'll be, that'll be something for sure. All right, Tony, man, thank you for coming on part one of Lost Rockers. Um, stick with us, friends, because uh, it's, there's lots of good stories to come. This book, again, is called Lost Rockers... Broken Dreams and Crash Careers. Right, and it's on Powerhouse Books. And what I'd like to say about, about um, Paul Rockman uh, is a, a director and filmmaker, and he has done a lot of famous rock videos like Alice in Chains' Man in the Box. Uh, he worked in the 90s for propaganda films, and he made a lot of famous rock videos like all Pantera, Cowboy from Hell, made Kiss on Holy, huh. and... Uh, he made uh, a lot of famous videos everybody loves and made a couple films, one of them American Hardcore. So that's where he comes into play. That's when these guys started working together. All right, Tony. I will talk to you in a couple of days. Thanks a lot for doing this. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, you gotta, I'm going to bring the Tecate next time. All right. There you go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Talk to you later, friend. All right. Thanks, Michael. All right. Bye-bye. All right, there you go. Part one of Lost Rockers. Lots of great stories in this book, friends. Um, I can't get enough of stories about artists who were on the verge of stardom and then somehow or another they blew it or it got blown for them. Stick with us. The book is a lot better than I'm giving it credit for, but uh, I'll talk to you next time, friends. It's a rock and roll geek train wreck.